Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I do speak a little bit of French and can understand a bit of Portuguese, but I'm more comfortable in English, so bear with me, I'll speak in English. I've been asked to address three questions. Um, the first one is how uh, transnational organized crime uh, threatens national security. Uh, two, who are the critical stakeholders uh, when designing uh, programs or strategies to combat transnational organized crime. And uh, lastly, to conduct an assessment of programs and initiatives that have been undertaken uh, bilaterally, but also in, in uh, multilateral settings to address transnational organized crime on the African continent. To begin with the first question, how uh, does transnational organized crime threaten national security? I think that question, to answer that question, one has to begin with an understanding of national security. Is it regime security? Is it uh, state security? Or is it a broader concept encompassing uh, wider interests, not just regime interests, state interests, but also the citizens' interests. And our approach, which we like to, 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 to advocate, is the, la the, the, the last approach, which is that national security is a broader concept that encompasses all uh, three elements. How you understand national security, uh, I think, bears on uh, what threats are taken seriously in your countries, uh, which threats are privileged in some countries, and it's often the case that regime security is prioritized, and therefore uh, threats that exist on the geographic, uh, political, and maybe economic periphery are not taken as seriously as, as they should. Uh, and often transnational organized crime thrives in the geographic spaces that are either ungoverned or uh, barely governed. Uh, so it's important to start off with the right conception of national uh, security. I, I've looked at a number of constitutions, not all of them. Uh, I found one unique one that actually attempts to define national security. And this is the Kenyan Constitution, Article 238. Uh, I like uh, the neat definition it provides. You'll find definitions elsewhere. But I found that this is a unique constitution in the sense that it defines what national security is. It says that national security is the protection against internal and external threats to the country's territory integrity and sovereignty, its people, and I emphasize that, their rights, freedoms, property, peace, stability, and prosperity, and other national interests. So it's an all-encompassing um, definition, which unfortunately in practice uh, doesn't turn out uh, that way. <coughs> so national security would encompass uh, uh, vital institutions, sectors essential to the survival of the state and the welfare of its people. How does transnational organized crime threaten national security as understood in this broad sense? First, it can and has destroyed institutions, including uh, the security sector institution, uh, which renders them ineffective and unable to dispense their mandates. Uh, and, and how does it do that? Uh, uh, we heard from my colleague about the role that corruption plays in creating a favorable environment, but also providing the fuel for transnational uh, organized crime. When members of the security sector are co-opted by criminal networks, uh, they become either agents or essentially look the other way when they should be acting in particular ways to respond to threats posed by these networks, that of course uh, uh, 
can be seen as uh, uh, an inability of that institution to function as it should. It weakens the rule of law, transnational organized crime. And it does that in a variety of ways. If we understand the rule of law as the idea that everyone and everyone within the state should operate under the law and that you should have legal rules that are certain, uh, that are predictable, uh, that in a way that they can govern uh, people's behavior, but also understanding the rule of law as, uh, from an institutional perspective, uh, ju judiciary, uh, uh, the criminal justice in, in general, including the police, uh, as functioning in a particular way. Uh, and then when you insert uh, the distortions that transnational organized crime introduce, um, you, uh, you find that uh, it, 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 it poses challenges for the rule of law. Um, and there are many examples that, that one, one can give on the African continent. Of course, it endangers in the third place the physical security of citizens. Due, number one, to the fact that transnational organized organizations tend to use violence. Uh, they don't just use corruption uh, to co-opt and influence public officials in order for them to operate unimpeded, but they also use violence. Uh, but also, um, it exposes people to insecurity because officials, the security sector officials that should be providing security, are becoming effective, as, as suggested earlier. Uh, if you look at a number of other manifestations of transnational organized crime, illegal fishing, uh, 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 wildlife poaching, uh, and, and, and illegal lumbering in terms of uh, forestry, there are a number of ways that one can uh, identify uh, how transnational organized, organized crime impacts national security. If you consider national security also to encompass the economic security of the people in that state, uh, wildlife poaching would uh, uh, you know, uh, reduce uh, uh, revenues for the state through the destruction of a natural heritage. Um, illegal fishing uh, in countries that are dependent uh, to one degree or to the other on, on fish stocks, uh, of course, depletes uh, food sources and creates a food security uh, situation. So I don't want to go into too much detail around here, but there are a variety of ways you can, uh, you can look at this question if you consider transnational organized crime uh, to relate to one trafficking in persons, trafficking in drugs, piracy, illegal lumbering, fishing, uh, and, and trafficking or proliferation of small arms, um, as well as uh, wildlife poaching. So there are a variety of ways in which transnational organ organized crime will impact each of those sectors, uh, which my colleague also cited. Who are the critical stakeholders um, uh, when designing uh, strategies for, for, uh, for addressing transnational organized crime. The security sector is a first port of call. It's a critical player in combating transnational organized crime. Security sector looked at not only uh, from the perspective of operational forces, uh, the police, the gendarmerie, uh, paramilitary, but also intelligence. Uh, intelligence, of course, that will identify uh, those threats, uh, and then that is translated into, um, into, into action. Criminal justice official, if you are to deploy the criminal justice approach to countering, uh, to combating these organizations uh, through uh, interdiction, investigations, and prosecution, the criminal justice becomes a critical part. Uh, so you're talking about judges, magistrates, investigators, and, and, and prosecutors. And strategies uh, that one has to design at the national level uh, must not only have a security component, you know, the hard, if you will, the hard edge, uh, but also uh, the criminal justice uh, um, side. 
Uh, economic regulators are critical players in, in uh, combating transnational organized crime. Uh, so we're talking about the treasury, uh, the banking sector. Remember corruption uh, um, is a key pillar on which the activities of this organization rests. But also uh, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, these criminal organizations move money around. They launder their money. Uh, uh, regulators, financial sector regulators are critical players uh, in this, uh, in this uh, strategy of combating uh, their activities. Donors and security partners, partners are critical, not just in uh, 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 mobilizing resources, financial resources, but also technical resources. Uh, uh, capacity building has become a critical part of um, enabling uh, uh, players on the African continent uh, to develop the, the right capacities uh, to interdict, investigate, and prosecute uh, uh, this crime. So uh, the activities of donors and financial and other security partners are important. So here we're talking about the US government, which I'll uh, refer to shortly. Uh, UNODC, that's the UN Office on Drugs and, 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 and uh, Corruption. Uh, and Interpol, these are critical partners in uh, countering transnational uh, organized uh, crime. The African Union, which is the continental, continental intergovernmental body, is an important player, but also the uh, regional economic communities. One would perhaps pose the question, how does the AU become a player in this? Um, I'll shortly refer to some interventions that the AU has undertaken. Now, one is in terms of just mobilizing uh, states, galvanizing them uh, to respond to specific threats that are seen uh, as having continental importance, uh, uh, but also in, in creating uh, an environment for a collective appreciation of where the threats are in the first place, uh, but also uh, creating mechanisms for coordinating uh, um, uh, cooperation between states in a variety of ways that I will refer to uh, uh, shortly. So the last part of my, uh, my talk uh, relates to the responses. How can we assess some of the responses that have been um, undertaken in combating transnational organized crime? Now, these measures that have been undertaken have um, either focused or have been framed through the security or defense lens, uh, the health lens, but also from the, the uh, perspective of building capacity uh, of national uh, authorities and institutions to better manage uh, uh, and police borders, uh, to interdict, in, uh, investigate, and prosecute uh, criminals. What are some of these interventions? Uh, there are various initiatives by both intergovernmental bodies uh, and other, uh, and, and, but also states. So the first kind of type or category of intervention is norm generation. In the last about 20, 15 years, uh, there has been an enormous, a tremendous activity in the area of generating norms and rules uh, that require states uh, to cooperate with each other. Uh, remember, these are transnational uh, threats to security. So uh, the, you'll find an organization uh, that is based in one country, but its activities impact uh, country B, or uh, this, this organization would be you know, operating in one of several, two or several countries at the same time, uh, and the operations stretching more, two or more countries, uh, and the other permutations that one I can think about. So cooperation is a critical part of addressing uh, transnational organized crime. So I mean, there are many, many uh, treaties and agreements uh, that have set out uh, these norms, and I don't have to go into too much detail, but I can cite a few. Uh, 
Uh, at the level of the African Union, uh, you do have the Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption, uh, uh, CIDIC, the Southern African Development Corporation, uh, the Protocol on Mutual Legal Assistance, ECOWAS also has a Convention on Mutual Legal Assistance. We do have the Algiers Convention on Combating Terrorism. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few uh, UN multilateral treaties that deal with the specific question of one, uh, transnational organized crime, but also uh, uh, with drugs, uh, drug trafficking. And I don't need to go into this. There are about three, actually there are three in number. Uh, which deal with manufacture, traf uh, uh, manufacture, uh, uh, and transfer of drugs. But you do have we do have an agreement as well, a treaty on the manufacture and trafficking of firearms, and a UN convention on, against corruption, and of course there is an AU uh, counterpart uh, as well. So that is the first kind of category of responses. The second one is corporation, corporation arrangements, uh, which I suggested is a critical part of dealing with transnational crimes. There are a variety of things I can say here. At the level of the African Union, uh, 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 it has developed two successive action plans in cooperation with the UNRDC. An action plan on combating drugs and crime in Africa. Uh, which sets out to strengthen the capacity uh, of the AU Commission and regional economic uh, communities in implementing the plan to support policy making at the national level, norm setting, and capacity building at the continental, regional, and national levels as well. Uh, what it does, which is interesting, that one, it creates an, an interagency coordination me mechanism within the AU Commission in Addis Ababa. Uh, it also made provision uh, for the appointment of national focal points on this specific question. And 31 countries so far have focal points on, uh, on combating uh, on drugs. And thirdly, uh, the most recent uh, action plan proposed the creation of a fund uh, within uh, regional economic communities because they found that funding uh, uh, was a major problem uh, a challenge to implementing the, the action plan. We do have a number of other things which I don't need to go into, but the third category of responses is capacity building, which is a critical one. Uh, and important players here is the United States government, uh, UNODC as well, uh, which have uh, 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 implemented uh, mul both multilateral and bilateral uh, programs on capacity building in a variety of areas. The United States, you may know, has a strategy to combat transnational organized crime, and this strategy commits the United States government to help partner countries to strengthen governance and transparency, break the corruptive power of transnational criminal networks, and to serve our state crime alliances. Uh, and the number of programs that have been implemented within the State Department, uh, I don't need to go into those. What I would say is that some of this focus uh, regionally in West Africa, uh, and they have done interesting things there. Uh, uh, particularly the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, uh, which works with partner countries to deliver justice and fairness by strengthening the role of police courts and, uh, and corrective systems. So far, I noted that they are, it's working in 30 African countries, implementing different things. From our perspective, um, uh, I want to mention that one of the things uh, uh, they do uh, is to build the capacity of government officials, young reformers, and non-governmental organizations, uh, recognizing the role non-security uh, uh, people or persons play you not know, only in designing strategies, but also uh, in their implementation. I'd like to finish with some lessons that can be drawn, if I still have some time, three minutes, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, what are some of the lessons that can be drawn from these initiatives uh, that have been developed to respond to transnational organized crime? Political will is critical. Political will uh, uh, to uh, understand what the problem is and to do something about it. Uh, either 
uh, in cooperation with other states, uh, but also with other security partners. It's often the case that because of the benefits individuals in the security sectors derive with the corrupt activities of transnational organized crimes, that the security sector becomes a stakeholder in the activities. And change, people resist change uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, so having political will uh, is, is, is critical to carry through uh, these programs. Because reforming the, not only the security sector to better respond to the threats, but also the criminal justice system uh, has economic costs for some individuals in that sector. Uh, that civil society and donors provide vital perspectives in combating transnational organized crimes, uh, they not only help mobilize resources and technical uh, skills that are needed, but also um, in bringing analytical, uh, an analytical perspective uh, that leads to a much more effective program, uh, perhaps, one would think. There are a number of other lessons that one can draw, uh, uh, and this is critical. Sharing information of information is, is, is critical to combating not only transnational organized crime, but also terrorism and other security sets, uh, threats. It is often the case that, that components of the security sector do not communicate very well, do not talk to each other. That intelligence may have information that you know, such and such a thing is happening, uh, and that information is not communicated to the operational forces, or when it does, it's not translated as it should um, into, uh, into actions, um, either by the security sec operational components or into evidence for purposes of um, uh, prosecutions by the criminal justice system. There are a few other things I can say, uh, but I think I'll stop here. We can address those in the Q&A. Thank you.